What are we discussing on today's Locked on Dimebacks podcast? Is it time for the D-backs to start thinking about other closing options? You are Locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Dimebacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You're listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer, so please go check out my website, millerthomas24.myportfolio.com. On there, you can see all my latest work, from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. If you want to see more, content by me please follow me on twitter at career thomas 24 for my personal account or look up locked on dimebacks on both twitter and instagram for the podcast handle and please follow the personal insta miller.thomas123 always at a d-backs game so follow me on there as well today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down the sports stop sporting like we want them to but this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There is something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get started. On today's Locked On Dimebacks podcast, we'll talk about Paul Seawald blowing another D-backs game. Is it time for a new closer? And we'll discuss the pitching duel in game number two. Thank you for making Locked On Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you. My loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free. It's available on all platforms. So please continue to tell your friends. One of those platforms is YouTube. So please hit subscribe to Locked on Diamondbacks on YouTube. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back to the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast. Let's talk about that game one loss to the Atlanta Braves because that game was lost because of Seawald sucking once again. And it's sad to say because I love Paul Seawald. I'm a Seawald guy, but right now he's in a funk. And with his last three blown saves, you can make a real argument that the D-backs should be on a nine-game winning streak. They won the last two games against Oakland. They blew game one against the Dodgers after making a very nice comeback, a lead in the ninth. Seawald blows that. You win the next two. Then you blow game one to the Padres, courtesy of Paul Seawald, before winning the next two. Now this series against the Braves. You haven't been in Atlanta all year. Great opportunity to finally get a win against one of the best teams of the National League. You're looking good after six. You're entering the ninth with the lead. And once again, Paul Seawald blows the game for the D-backs. And these are huge games. This is NL West division leader, LA Dodgers. This is... Wild card team right ahead of you in the standing San Diego Padres, also in the NOS. And then best team, arguably in the National League, maybe on paper, maybe not by record in the Atlanta Braves. Three straight crushing blows for Paul Seawald. And in two of the three opportunities, he had two outs. That's what makes it so much more frustrating. He was one out away from converting the save and getting the D-backs a win. Even if he converted one of those three opportunities, you would feel a lot better about Paul Seawald than you do right now. But instead, Seawald, three straight blown saves, and now it got you questioning whether or not Seawald should be the closer going forward. And can even make the argument the D-backs against Atlanta specifically should have won all four games against Atlanta this year because you go back and look at every single game against the Braves this season, the D-backs have led against the Braves after six innings in every single game. The D-backs jump out early against the Braves, and then the Braves always come back in the last three innings with an offensive attack. And I thought maybe it would be different this time around because I think our bullpen's a lot better than when we first faced Atlanta. We didn't even have Paul Seawald, I think, when we first faced Atlanta. Now we do, and everyone in the bullpen did their job except for Paul Seawald, which is just so frustrating. The D-backs lineup has been playing so much better recently, right? We've talked about how the guys who have been struggling all year finally starting to come around. We saw some signs of life from Corbin Carroll in that game one. Eugenio Suarez over the last couple of weeks has been a lot better. Moreno coming off the injured list has been a lot better. Like Guriel and June crushed it. Like the players in the lineup have been playing a lot better over the last few weeks. A lot of the relievers have been better. 
right? Bryce Jarvis has been better in June. We love Justin Martinez. We love Ryan Thompson. Ginkle has turned around this season. Like we're starting to trust some of the relievers in the bullpen. We got a great start recently from Ryan Nelson. Like the vibes have been up for the D-backs the last couple of weeks. It feels like last year's team is finally starting to come alive and come out the woodworks. It feels like they've been in like hiding and hibernation the last few months, you know, dealing with that World Series hangover. We see the Texas Rangers dealing with it. It felt like the D-backs were dealing with it for most of the season, but felt like something clicked in June, felt like something over the last three or four weeks, something clicked where the D-backs are finally starting to look like last year's team. We're seeing more clutch offense late in these games, like we saw it against the Braves most recently in game one, saw against the Padres, we saw against the Dodgers, like the D-backs are finally starting to score late, right? The answer backs are finally able to score late. They're finally creating chaos on the bases again, stealing extra bases, uh, moving runners over, doing a little small ball, like the small ball for the D-backs over the last three weeks. Feels like it's back in a big way. We're doing everything that made us a good team last year, except for the fact that we now have a closer struggling once again. That has been the kryptonite of this D-backs team. Since I've taken over the podcast in 2020, I think closing games has been the biggest issue for the D-backs during what? My last four years of this podcast. And it was the one area that I probably wasn't worried about. Like second base with Ketel Marte, first base with Christian Walker, closer over with Paul Seawald. Like those are some of the pillars that I was not worried about at all coming into this year. Seawald was so good last year. He was nails in the postseason until he got to the World Series, of course. And for most of this season, he was nails too until July flipped. Seawald was 11 for 11 with like a .54 ERA. It's hard to believe because Seawald all of a sudden after his most recent blow up outing, 393 ERA, you know, on the cusp of a four. But prior to his last three blown saves, Seawald had a point. 5-4 ERA. That tells you how bad he's been in his last three blown saves, all against quality opponents. It does make you worried because Seawald, we know in the past, we've seen it against teams he's familiar with. He does face adversity. And now the D-backs have to question whether he should be the closer going forward. And I want to dive into that question more in segment number two, but I thought Seawald was the best D-backs closer of maybe the last 10 years. Like, I was literally telling someone that as he entered his save opportunity against the Dodgers last week, I was literally gushing to a homie at a sports bar. Is Seawald the best closer we've ever seen in our D-backs lives? Is he the best closer in D-backs franchise history of the last 10 years? Like, Seawald should potentially be an all-star? Like, I was gushing about Seawald. Then he does that against the Dodgers. And now the last three blown saves uh, has people feeling a certain way about Paul Seawald. And this was a series going against the Braves. Or excuse me, this was a series going against the Braves where you really had an opportunity. I thought the Braves were looking vulnerable. But now it's Paul Seawald who's looking vulnerable. And I just don't know if I can trust him. And we're going to talk about more about Paul Seawald in segment number two, but I don't want to end in segment number one without talking about Diaz, who made his debut for the D-backs. He looked absolutely phenomenal. Face adversity, gave up that first inning home run, battled back in a big way, had an opportunity with, like, what, two runners on, nobody out, skated out of that, skated out of more trouble late in that game. Like, this is a guy who they said he was a vendor before signing his professional contract. Like, he was selling ice cream in stadiums, just looking for his opportunity. Signed with the D-backs a few years ago. Now he's in his early 20s, throwing 98, got some real heat. This could be a guy for the D-backs. I thought Mena could be a guy for the D-backs. This could actually be a real dude. I, I still like Mena a lot, but Diaz came in immediately against one of the best teams in the NL and looked great against them. He looked like a seasoned veteran. Yes, he had some things that he needs to work out, but for the most part, he had good command, he had good velocity, good break on his pitches. I thought Diaz was really good, and I'm very curious to see how he looks going forward and, and, and curious to see how much more opportunity the D-backs give him this season. You got a clutch Corbin Carroll hit in game number one. Don't want to overlook that. Carroll has been in a slump all season, and anytime he gets clutch hits, I love to see that. Love to see the small ball work in extra innings. Great job by Domo. And uh, I forgot who scored Domo in extra innings off the top of my head. Uh, who was it? 
Perdomo hit the sacrifice fly with Jake McCarthy scored. Great job by doing small ball and extras. Ginkle and Thompson did their job. Everyone did their job in game number one, except Paul Seawald, which is frustrating. That's why we'll talk about D-backs closing options in segment number two. But hey, check out the number one daily fantasy sports app called Prize Picks because with over 5 million active members, it is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps, on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stats projections and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the daily actions with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000. Prize picks is available in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. Download the prize picks app today and use code locked on MLB for first deposit match up to $100. That's code locked on MLB on prize picks for a deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And if you believe the D-backs are going to come back against Atlanta and win any of the next few games, why not bet on it with America's number one sports book, FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sporting like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. My favorite thing to do on FanDuel is the same game parlay. Give me the D-backs money line. Gallon on the mound in game two. Give me Gallon over on strikeouts and give me a Corman Carroll stolen base. When that hits, it brings a big smile to my face. And if you want a big smile on your face, head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back to the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. And quick FYI, I am back on the East Coast for potentially the rest of July. I don't think I'll be going to any D-backs games unless they're coming out to the East Coast. Uh, I do think they go to Boston potentially next month. I would have to check the schedule to see if the D-backs are coming over to the East Coast anytime soon. But going forward, the new schedule for podcasts will probably be morning drops. I don't think it'll be as late as I'm doing today. I got in last night at like 2 a.m., so I slept in a little bit today. Uh, But going forward, I think you'll probably get podcasts around 8, 9 a.m. in the morning, potentially earlier. So be on the lookout. Not too many more nighttime drops, probably early morning drops going forward while I'm on the East Coast, just so you guys can plan accordingly. But now let's get into the podcast and let's talk about whether or not Paul Seawald needs a role change. Uh, Tori Lovello has already come out and said Seawald is still going to be our closer going forward. And I don't think that I don't think that's a big surprise. I mean, Seawald has been really good for most of the season. He was really good last year. I don't think it's a surprise that Tori Lovello wants to continue to keep confidence in Paul Seawald and wants to build him up and, you know, say the right thing from the media that he's still our closer. But we also know Tori Lovello is a guy that sometimes gets overly committed to his players. You don't need to keep playing Jace Peterson. I like Paven Smith this year, but Paven Smith the last couple of years, way too many at-bats and plate appearances. Like Tori Lovello is a player's guy, and at times it's an issue because he will play a guy who sucks for way too long. Seawald currently is in a slump. I don't think he sucks, but I do think Seawald needs a role change right now. The D-backs are just a few games out from the All-Star break. I don't think it's time to start messing with, you know, potential wins. Like, the D-backs are desperate. They need to keep pace in the wild card. They still need a playoff spot, a wild card spot. They don't have either. And so I don't think you can just fumble these wins away. I think it's too big, these games. Uh, I think these games are way too big. You can't just keep fumbling them away. I love Paul Seawald. I think Paul Seawald at the end of the season will be the D-backs closer. But right now, in the short term, at least until the All-Star break, maybe the rest of July, I do think there should be a role change for Paul Seawald. Now, it might not come unless he blows his fourth Fifth save, but I'm saying right now, 
Tori Lavello needs to pull the plug short term on Paul Seawald. We just can't trust him right now. After three blown saves in very important games, the D-backs need to go with guys who are just more trustworthy right now. And for once, the D-backs actually have too many solid options currently where you can't just keep running out Paul Seawald. There are actually other options that are competent for once in D-backs franchise history. Over the last few years, all the options for D-backs closer were horrendous. But for once, the D-backs actually have solid options on who should be their closer. That's why I don't think you should keep running Paul Seawald out there. At the end of the day, I think Seawald will be the closer by the season's end. But right now, I think Paul Seawald needs to get that Kevin Ginkle treatment. Ginkle started the season as the D-backs closer with Seawald on the mound. But Ginkle was not very good as the D-backs closer. He struggled mightily. So the D-backs, what did they do? They demoted him from that closer role. They started using him in more of the middle innings, fifth, sixth, seventh, to build up that confidence. And now when you watch Paul, now when you watch Kevin Ginkle pitch, he looks like the guy that pitched last year for the D-backs. I was confident. I was throwing 97-98 with that fastball and shutting down opposing hitters. Like, Ginkle was electric last year. And to start the season, he looked mortal this year. He looked very unconfident and not sure of himself. But he looks back to being an elite reliever. And I do think there is something with Paul Seawald where opponents who see him a lot do get familiar with his stuff and... I think Seawald in those moments become a little bit more vulnerable against the NOS teams and teams that have seen him a little bit more. I still think Paul Seawald can be great. I mean, he was nails 95% of the time last postseason until game one of the World Series. He was nails 95% of this season. So I still think Paul Seawald, even though opponents might be familiar with his stuff, you know what's coming, I still think he can make it work and still be great in big games. He has a lot of moxie too. So I think from a intangible perspective i still trust paul seawald as a closer just not right now it wasn't that long ago paul seawald had a one had a one run save against the philadelphia phillies when they were rolling that was like a couple weeks ago so it wasn't that long ago we've seen paul seawald be clutch in very big games against some of the best teams and i want paul seawald to get back to form but right now he needs to take a little break. That's why there are three candidates that the D-backs should consider. I know Tori Lavella wants to keep with Paul Seawald for now, but another blown save, he really has to consider his other options, which are Kevin Ginkle, Ryan Thompson, and Justin Martinez. Martinez, I think, has the nastiest stuff and probably the best repertoire to be repertoire. I'm hope I'm saying that correctly, to be a closer. But I also think Martinez is also the most erratic. He is a guy that would walk the most people. So even though I think Martinez is the closer of the future, post Paul Seawald, I'm not ready to hand him the keys just yet. Ginkle was the closer for the beginning of the season, but I don't like Ginkle as a closer. Ginkle is at his best in non-save situations. If you just look at the numbers this year, over a five-year array in 14 innings pitch of save situations, but non-save situations, he has a one ERA. Ginkle is elite as a setup man or a high leverage reliever. But as a closer, I don't like Kevin Ginkle. That's why my pick is Ryan Thompson. All three of these relievers are very good in high leverage moments, good at runners in scoring position. But Ryan Thompson has a slightly better ERA this season in save situations as opposed to to non-save situations, and he's got a funky delivery to keep hitters off balance. I'll go Ginkle in the eighth, Thompson in the ninth, and then you go with Paul Seawald in that six, seven range. Obviously, Martinez is still a back-end high-leverage reliever for you, but put Seawald in more of those middle innings until he gets back to form. I still love Seawald, but D-backs are too desperate right now to give away games. And for once, the D-backs have too many options that can actually do the closer job. So for now, I think P. I think P. Seawald needs to get a little demotion in his role. Now we'll talk about the amazing pitching duel that we'll see in segment number two. Hey, if you need any help filing your taxes this season, I suggest Tax Network USA. 
Here on Locked On Ninebacks, we pride ourselves on getting you the latest news for your team, whether it's the offseason, the draft, spring training, or the playoffs. It's year-round. You know what else is year-round? Collection season. Just because tax season is over doesn't mean the IRS will stop coming after you for unfiled taxes. The IRS can garnish your wages, levy your bank accounts, and even seize your property. Don't let the IRS target you. Let the licensed professionals and tax experts at Tax Network USA go to bat for you. With over 14 years of experience and an A-plus rating by the Better Business Bureau, Tax Network USA has saved their clients over $1 billion in tax debt. Whether you owe taxes, have complicated matters that require tax planning, or finally hit that parlay this season and need help correctly filing, call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on. And be sure to mention Locked On Dimebacks at checkout and you'll receive a $250 discount off their services. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. Let's do a little preview of game number two against the Atlanta Braves because we got ourselves a legit pitching duel in game two. Zach Gallen versus Chris Sale. And really fun to see because these are two of the better pitchers in the National League. And for Chris Sale, it's honestly a little surprising. I kind of wrote off Chris Sale after the last few years. I still thought like he had more left in his tank than what we've seen the last few years. But I thought the days of Chris Sale being like a number one starter for you were done. I thought Chris Sale could still be a valuable, you know, back end, uh, you know, still be a valuable rotation playoff starter, maybe a number three, number four in your rotation for the playoffs. Probably not going to give you 200 innings, just load manage him until you get to the postseason. And then from there, you feel like he can dominate. But Sale this season has been way better than that. He's almost at 100 innings pitch already this season. He's at 99.2. Uh, the last time, I mean, in 2019, he made 147 innings pitch. Like, that was the last time he made over 105 innings pitch was 2019 with 147. Like, Chris Sale will probably crush that number. Like, the last few years, he just... Has barely pitched. 2020 didn't pitch at all with COVID. 2021, 42 innings. 2022, five innings. 2023, 102 innings. Like, Chris Sale will probably hit his highest inning pitch total maybe since 2019, maybe since 2018, maybe since 2017. Like, Chris Sale is having himself a fantastic season. And personally, I do love a Chris Sale. You know, as I said, I grew up as a Red Sox fan on the East Coast. So I have a lot of love for Chris Sale back what he did with the Red Sox in 2018 and everything like that. But I thought since then, I thought Chris Sale probably was a little bit cooked. I mean, he's dealt with a lot of injuries over the last few years. I still thought he could be a good playoff pitcher, but being a frontline starter like a Zach Allen or a Merrill Kelly that you trust in game one and game two. I didn't think Chris Sale had that left in his tank, but I was completely wrong. He's back to being healthy. He's pitching every game and he looks dominant. Once again, this looks like 2018 Chris Sale. We finish fourth in Cy Young voting like Chris Sale right now leads the National League and wins with 11 has the best FIP has the best whip has the best strikeouts per walk like Chris Sale has been dominant this year. And actually, if you look at FanDuel, he is right behind Zach Wheeler in terms of Cy Young odds. So this is a pretty fun pitching duel, I believe, in game number two, Gallon versus Chris Sale. And for the D-backs offense, I love seeing them punch the Braves in the mouth early. And I want to see them do that once again against Chris Sale, against one of the best pitchers in the National League right now. Go create offense and chaos early. The D-backs love doing that. They're a great first inning team. They're great in the first couple innings. Let's see you do it one more time against Chris Sale, who also, when you look at the numbers, that first inning is probably the biggest struggle for Chris Sale. He has the highest OPS allowed in the first inning, 815 OPS. He's allowed the most home runs on the season in the first inning. So if you are going to jump on Chris Sale, do it early. The best first inning team in baseball going against a pitcher where he struggles the most in the first inning, go out there and punch Chris Sale in the mouth early. And now also, now that the D-backs, we know that they can score runs early. I also trust the D-backs to score runs late. We know the Braves are going to have a late offensive attack. Like that's, there's no doubt about that. But I also believe the D-backs offense can do enough to score late and keep up with the Braves offense. The biggest question for the D-backs is 
Will the will their bullpen step up late in the game to slow down the Braves' offensive attack? Randall Grichik, he's had great success against Sale in his career. Would love to see him in the finale. I expect him to be in the lineup against a lefty Chris uh, against lefty Chris Sale, Randall Grichik, a righty. I expect him to be in the lineup. Will the D-backs go away from Seawald if it came to it? If there's another closing situation, maybe just because I don't know if you want to go back to back games with Paul Seawald in a safe situation, but Troy Lavello has said Seawald is still the closer for the D-backs going forward. So potentially if there is a safe situation, the D-backs do go back to Seawald tonight, but against the Padres, he blew game one and then game number two in extra innings. Troy Lavello did everything to not go to Seawald. He went to Humberto Cassianos to close out the game, and that's what Cassianos did. So with Troy Lavello using all his best relievers in game number one, Ginko, Thompson, Martinez, Seawald, I wonder what that means in game number two. Definitely it means we need length from Gallon. If Gallon could go six innings, maybe do like a Bryce Jarvis in the seventh, maybe, or like a Vieira in the seventh, Jarvis in the eighth, and maybe go with one of your better relievers to close it out in the ninth. Maybe go back to Paul Seawald, maybe go Ginkle or Thompson. We'll see uh, what the D-backs want to do with that. But with Fott banged up and Monty on the IL, like this is kind of a huge start for Gallon With the game one blown loss already, D-backs could really use a big bounce back game from their best starting pitcher in a Zach Gallon, And so uh, you can only pray Zach Gallon, who struggled. I-, I wouldn't say struggled in his most recent outing. He was fine, but it wasn't elite Zach Gallon. He had long pitch counts. He struggled to put guys away. Want to see a better version of Zach Gallon in this game against the Atlanta Braves. He still has potential to play in the all-star game if he goes on a little dominant run. Uh, you know, if he gets another start, if he looks good against the Braves, and then uh, w- would he potentially have? I think he potentially would have one more start against Toronto. So if he finishes the season or the first half of the season with two more quality starts, there's still potential for Zach Gallon to go to the All Star game, depending on injuries. And against the Braves in his career, Gallon has been good. Two, four, five year right and 25 innings pitch against the Braves over four starts. Would love to see that continue. The biggest issue for Gallon. Albies and Riley, two biggest Zach Allen killers. So just limit those two and you should be okay. Will we see Domo in the lineup against the lefty or will it be Kevin Newman and Eugenio Suarez on the left side of the infield? Want to see what Tory Lavelle does with that. Will we see Jake McCarthy in the lineup like with the, you know, with there being a lefty on the mound? Do we go McCarthy over Thomas in the lineup? Very curious to see what Tory Lavelle does with that. D-backs, though, need a big bounce back. They've lost the last three game ones in their last three series. They've lost the first game of the series. Then they've won the next two. So want to see the D-backs keep that trend going with a big Zach Gown performance in game number two against the Atlanta Braves. Now, that's it for this edition of the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy. Dose. No